Hello, everyone. Before we get started this week, I just want to mention that we this is another recording from when we were all together live. So just want to preface it with a little bit that the audio quality may not be up to our standards. We still had a great fun episode and we didn't want to just get rid of those episodes that we recorded while we were alive. They just had a lot more energy and we just had a lot of fun recording it. So we still submitted this episode to the feed. Sorry to anyone who may be sensitive to the audio issues. I can assure you that our next episode we will be back to normal but for this week there's a little bit of an audio issue and uh, but i still think it's a great fun episode i really think that you'll enjoy it we really thank you for subscribing to the show thank you thank you thank you and enjoy hello and welcome to go with the heat i'm dominic and i'm john I'm Jenna. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week, we're talking about Season 1, Episode 17, Rites of Passage. Originally premiered on February 8th, 1985. The director of this episode was David Ansbaugh, who we may remember from a very recent episode of Golden Triangle 2. So we have that train wreck of a second half of an episode as the director on this one. The writer was Daniel Pine, I believe is how you pronounce his name. He wrote all kinds of episodes including some of our favorites heart of darkness little prince and then some that we haven't seen yet the prodigal son definitely miami yankee dollar and trust fund pirates so he is a miami vice veteran where he's already written two episodes that we've watched before we get started i'd like to check in and see what's going on in each other's lives and if there's a secret we are all still sitting together recording episodes yay I'm sick of you people. <laughs> well, We're all you... trapped in your tiny little closet and it's weird and it smells <laughs> bad in here. I think there is plenty of room inside of my recording studio, not my closet. It's a closet when I'm getting clothes out of it. It's a recording studio <laughs> when we record the episode. If that were true, then you would remove all the clothes out of it. <laughs> Sometimes I need to do both. All right, I don't want to talk to you guys anymore. Let's I really go on wish with that you'd wear pants during this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're still having fun ha- being face to face talking about the episodes. We lined up a whole bunch of stuff. I'm gonna tell the- tell you guys the secret. I'm gonna sing. I want to know what love is. <laughs> oh, that was such a great. That was so great. Uh, okay, uh, uh, okay, we gotta hold that. We gotta hold that because that was such a great scene. Let's get on and talk about this episode. All right, guys, it's a solid Miami Vice opening. It's a weird Miami Vice opening because lots of things are insinuated here. And I don't know what Diane is up to on that beach when she's just walking down. It kind of feels like she was looking for a pimp. That That's her purpose of walking down the beach. Okay. Yeah, it was super weird. And they did, like, the camera was just, like, it starts out strange. It does that, like, triple zoom in on uh, Well, they did another on one of those face. montage, like the 80 montages of all the girls in their bathing suits. Like, it's a TNA opening, right? Mm-hmm. Right. They're like zooming in on crotches, girls bending over. And like wannabe Tom Cruise guy is just walking around scoffing, trying to put his sunglasses back on. That's what's weird too. Is what, so his name's Lyle, who we, we oh, that's have. that's even worse. Let's call him wannabe <laughs> Tom Cruise. <laughs> his name's Lyle. We have him through the entire episode. In fact, he's key in the in the end. Uh, Lyle has my favorite scene. <laughs> <actually>. <laughs> For me, it was weird too, because there's no... Crockett or tubs in the entire open. No. This is a Crockett sparse episode anyway. So mm-hmm. I don't know how they got away with that. It, with uh, with Don's ego. <laughs> it almost it almost feels like they just threw Crockett in because he had to be there. Like like they didn't actually have anything for him to do. No, say. but he's on set, so he's gotta be the the they're a duo. It's they come. weird when the B team gets more like like action and playtime than you get. And the B team is definitely regressing, right? We're going backwards with the B team. Someone, mm-hmm. we need an injunction it's on the B team. Yeah, it's getting pretty bad. Yeah. So let's set the scene here. We have this open where Diane, not wearing a bathing suit, she's just strolling along the beach. It's like a famous Miami beach. She's walking around. Everyone's in bathing suits. We're getting this montage of close-ups of girls in their bathing suits. Meanwhile, Lyle, our Tom Cruise-looking risky business guy standing at a bar on the beach which i guess that's just the thing in miami right they just have bars on beaches like that's just i mean i i would assume yeah so he's hanging at the bar scoping out all the chicks at the beach and he sees diane walking from way far away she walks up past the bar and walks up onto like a dock it's like a footbridge 
Yeah, like a backup yeah. from the beach to the top. And she just stops there, and Lyle comes up to talk to her, and he drops an amazing line. I'm gonna save this for to teach my son when he when he gets older. He says to Diane when she stops. So Lyle follows her up there. He's we think like he's just gonna go pick up on her. I was actually thinking that Lyle was gonna be a mass murderer. Uh, and she was going to get killed. But he walked up to her and says, you got a license to walk on this beach? Well, based on the whiplash you were inflicting back there, I wondered if you had a license for carrying a concealed weapon. See, he's got wow. game. <laughs> he's got some solid game. And apparently it worked because Diane had a good laugh at it. And it, it made me, there's, there's a point to those types of lines, right? Where they're so cheesy, they're funny. Like, you, you see the cheese in it, right, Jenna? No. <laughs> I don't know. I've always, one of my favorite lines has always been, I lost my teddy bear, can I snuggle with you? <laughs> and uh, I've always gotten kind of pretty good results out of it. <laughs> <laughs> they have, like, he, he, he drops that line. There's The names are changed. There's this Lion, Lyle and Diane Gordon. She's from, they yeah. already have a ship name. <laughs> <laughs> she's from Park Slope. She just got there. And she's wanted to give out a lot of information. She's from Park Slope. She just got there. And she's there alone. So, so She wanted to be killed. Right? <laughs> and then there's like a semi-montage after that. They go to lunch. They're laughing at lunch. He tells her that she could make 10 grand by being his hooker. Sure. Yeah. Well, model. he doesn't. Model. He says Let's, model. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Model. Yeah. Yeah. The- and that's what happens that night. We have this. Then there's like a big jump in time. We go to that night, and they're at David's house, who is played by John Turturro. Amazing John John Turturro. And John Turturro really just carries, at least for me, carries the episode. Um, he's just fantastic. Yeah, he, you know, he. I think he was what was missing from Uncle Polly when he was in, in that episode, right? Where Uncle Polly was creepy, but I don't think I ever felt threatened by Uncle Polly. I feel like if he was Uncle Polly's number two, true, that that would have been it. Would have upped Uncle Polly's creep factor, and then just made him like creepy and threatening. Yeah. Well, the thing is, yeah. like, Toretto is believable to be very social, very popular guy, but he's also got that threatening aspect to him. I think where he's kind of he can be kind of hostile. Well, yeah. he pulls it off really well later with mm-hmm. with uh, Diane, right? Yeah, with Diane at when they're like laughing and joking around and he goes like full like wife beater on yeah he just flips that switch yeah Yeah. so and that's what we get in this scene so we see that lyle he brought diane to the party but david is he's the pimp essentially he's looking over the party he sees that lyle had bought a new girl we have a brief talk between what looks like an older hooker not necessarily older but like she has been Been with them for the while Mm -hmm. yeah Mm -hmm. yeah and she goes up to talk to uh, Lyle, grabs her, and because she was supposed to be with a John, and she had come back down. She's like, well, I'm not into him. And he says, like, it's your job to be interested in him. So we have a little bit of foreshadowing of what's going to happen. Pretty, and pretty and at this point in the episode, it doesn't seem like any, any different modeling agency than I've ever seen. I mean, he has a <laughs> talent scout. <laughs> yep. goes out and brings them in they the women model and the women have to do special favors to get better modeling gigs <laughs> well lyle takes diane upstairs to see david she drops some serious 80s lingo she says she says the party's radical uh that was that was the thing that oh, she says boy. in there and so lyle leaves her with david and david tells her that he runs a modeling agency and that she he, she might be able to make up to ten thousand dollars a month we see that Diane's interested in that kind of thing. But you get the sense of, like, everyone kind of knows what's up. Diane know, kind of knows what's up. David knows what, what Diane's all about. Well, and we find out later, too, that Diane uh, uh, was a college student. But we also find out that she fell off the grid a few months ago. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, you, you can kind of get the sense that she's kind of fallen in with bad crowds already. And she's already kind of started that kind of wandering, looking for, almost looking for trouble. At the end of that conversation, we go to the, to the opening credits. No vice team, just John Turturro being creepy with Diane. Just real quick with the opening credits. And this is the first time I really was paying attention to it. Are they playing cricket in the open? No, that's High Lie. That, oh. that, that, that's what that game is, is High Lie, which there'll be an episode. That's Before we started this podcast, the one episode I had seen was the High Lie episode. I am very interested in High Lie and how okay. that game is played. 
Okay, because that that's what I was curious. Like I like I said, I never really paid attention to the Open. I'm just like, oh, yeah, Flamingos, blah, blah, blah. Everything's Miami-related. And I was like, wait a minute, cricket? Yeah. <laughs> Dude, is cricket popular in Florida? <laughs> when we come back from the credits, the ladies are with Castillo. So Gina and Trudy are with Castillo, and they're at, like, a bridge like, over a river or, or some, some part of the water. Trudy's outfit. Like, I was trying to place... So is she, like, trying to bust kids at the local mall, trying to dress like new kids on the block style? Or what was happening with I don't that? Know. I don't know what's up with the way Gina and Trudy dress. Like, Gina always dresses like she's going to Catholic school in Cuba. And <laughs> Trudy always dresses like she's a 12-year-old like who's playing on the street for, like, a Barney episode or something like, like a fallen youth. Well, I guess it doesn't really matter as long as they have Castillo's money. <laughs> True. <laughs> I, I I was wondering like so it's a pantsuit and it's got like finger paintings of pizza on it. Yeah. That, that, that's some way that I can sum up what what what, what Trudy's wearing. <laughs> she she teaches a kindergarten class on the side. The, 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 the kids in the class made her that dress. Well, the, what what's happening is that they're pulling a body out of the river. I think it's river. It's a waterway of some some sort. They're pulling a body out. There's no ID on the body. No markings on the body. They're not 100 percent sure if it's someone killed her or if it's a suicide. They're just pulling the body out of the water. Why is the vice squad there for that? I don't know. I don't know. This whole episode, like, that's you, not, yeah, just that's, consistently ask, why is the vice squad there? That's not their jurisdiction. Not yeah, at all. yeah. W- so. Where's homicide? Were they too busy? Were they I, working a drug sting? They, well, is this <laughs> opposite thing? <laughs> well, as we know from Smuggler's Blues, homicide can't be trusted, and they're down a man now too because they had to pull his body out of the river too. So, <laughs> uh, um, the world um, lost the Miami Dolphins fan. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Castillo stops the gurney as it's going by. The pulls back the sheet, and you see it's the hooker from the opening that said that she was interested in the guy that, and you know, got a veiled threat from Lyle. Camera pans, and we see a Tina Turner-haired woman standing in the crowd, looking over the investigation, and it is the none other than Pam freaking Greer in this episode. Jackie Brown, y'all. I I couldn't believe that that Pam Greer was in this episode, and I had. Melissa had hinted at it that Pam Greer was in it, but she's in another episode in season two. Really? Yeah. She's like so of of all the guest stars that we've had so far, she's the first like I would say genuine star. Yeah, I mean, I think if you look at all the other guest stars, I mean, like you, Torino, I mean Bruce Willis, all, all of them, this it was at the beginning of their career. They yeah, had, they became stars after. Yeah, yeah, they weren't really established yet. They hadn't done anything really big to differentiate. I mean, I think Pam Greer is definitely the biggest star um, at the time that yeah. they had on there. I mean, and she, she looks amazing, and throughout the episode, her acting is amazing throughout throughout the episode. But I was just I was floored because like it's a, she's a genuine star. That they had on as a guest star in here. The other ones we've talked about, you know, with Bruce Willis and and Dan he- Hedaya, Ed O'Neill, and, yeah, Ed O'Neill. Like, but you're right. Like, there was at the beginning of their careers. So like, Pam Greer is an action hero, and she's yeah. in this episode. Well, as she as we see her in the crowd, she starts walking along the scene, and she, and she walks by, and there's Lyle sitting there at the crime scene as well. We cut and go back to the precinct. This is where we have we got to talk about the B team guys. We got to talk with someone. We need an intervention with the B team. They're messing around with their with their bug busters van. They're like trying to repair the bug that's on top of the van because and not because it's broken. What well, it is broken? But the van runs just fine. They're trying to fix it when they push the button in the cab that it makes the wings flap on the bug on top of the van. Priorities, Zeno. Dominic. Priorities. <laughs> I mean, I guess if we're talking about an episode where the Vice team's just out doing whatever the hell they want to, this is where they spend their, this is what the B team is spending their time on. Switek is inside of the van pushing the button. Zito is up on the roof trying to fix it. And it becomes very Three Stooges like in their attempts to fix it. It's yeah. just frustrating. Like, they're so cringy and they've just gotten worse and worse. Like, they're very slapstick and it's annoying. And they, so, so let's get this straight. Like, they do terrible slapstick comedy. Like my note literally says, like, make it stop, please. And then then they can't keep a hold of anyone. Like, remember in Glades, like, they just, while they're looking at each other in the bathroom, they let the suspect get out of the house. You know, like, they constantly do that kind of stuff. They're not good cops. Apparently, they're not very handy. <laughs> <laughs> it really makes you feel for Lester, who's been totally cut out at this point. Yes. really 
He would he would be above this bug business. I think they must be going through budget cuts in the Miami Police Department because, you know, they had to get rid of the Lester, the qualified guy, which means that they had to find something to do with uh, Zwitek and Zito taking over. I mean, they have to make their money somehow because clearly they're not making it with arrests. True. I mean, maybe their bug busting business will help keep the vice team afloat. <laughs> they're legitimately bu- <laughs> bug guys on the side. What is unfortunate is that it doesn't look like the van is going away anytime soon. So no. this is not the only time we're going to see them messing around with the bugs no, on the van. It seems like the bug oh. on the van is going to be just as important as the Nug Man or Izzy that the bug is going to make that many appearances. That's horrible. That's horrible <laughs> news. I love how Jimmy Smith couldn't last more than 30 seconds in the episode. <laughs> right? But Zito and Zwitek and the bug van are going to be here for the whole run. <laughs> While they're messing with it, Tubbs and Crockett come drive it up and they like have a good laugh at the B team as they're trying to work on it. Cause what happens is they that- think they're cops. <laughs> <laughs> what happens is, is that Switek hits the button and the wings pop off and Zito flies off the roof onto the ground. And then Tubbs and Crockett pull up and they have a good laugh at him. Although Zito does say that, uh, they, I, that he says, like they mentioned that they pulled the hooker out of the river. And that's like, what the story is of the morning. Ow, man, fell off the top of the bus. Oh, by the way, we pulled a hooker out of the water this morning. (laughs) Kind of segue. (laughs) She's still downstairs if you want to go poke her with a stick. (laughs) They drive in, and Tubbs and Crockett come walking into the precinct. And from a distance, Tubbs sees something happening in Castillo's office. I think it's Castillo's office or one of the meeting rooms. He comes walking up to the room, and he sees in there is Trudy Castillo, and Pam Greer, Valerie is her name in this episode. Tub comes, Tubbs comes in. It just like tractor beams onto Valerie, it's which is so awkward and very unprofessional. He was not invited to this meeting. No, he just he just barges in. He sees Valerie and just walks right over to her and hug and and hugs her. What's so awkward is that she just stands there with her arms at her side and he's hugging her like a child. Like he's yeah. like he's so excited. Oh my god, you're here! And like you think he's gonna like jump her? Yeah, and Gina and Trudy are having a good laugh. Right, like they're watching it happen. Yeah, she clearly does not. She was clearly hoping to talk to the captain without running into Tubbs, and now she has to deal with this awkwardness. And then Tubbs like basically steals her from the meeting. Basically, just drags her away. Like. Come look yeah. at my Legos. <laughs> <laughs> I can jump off the high dive. Well, yeah, and that's what they, that's what happens is that Valerie and Tubbs then go for a walk in the park. Tubbs is pushing on. I didn't know you were in town. How come you didn't call me? How come I didn't know that you were here? Well, I had to call this guy. I called these people. I called these people. I basically spoke to everyone but you. Yeah, yeah, she spoke to everybody in the entire in the entire city of Miami without talking to Tubbs and then tells Tubbs, well, I didn't want to bother you. Oh, oh, and she also mentions she's been there for, what, six months? Well, she's been looking for her sister for six months. She hasn't, I don't think she's saying that she's been in Miami for six months. She's definitely been there for at least a few weeks. Yeah, she has been there for a while already, but I think what she's saying is that she's looking for her sister, Diane. Her sister has been missing for six months. Her and her, some friends went out and they went to a bunch of different cities. Yeah. They like went on this road trip. They were gone for a long time. And then the friends showed back up and Diane wasn't with them. Right. So she's been on this journey trying to find her little sister. And she kind of hints at the fact like she's been supporting her sister while going through college almost. Their whole and- relationship is really weird to me in this episode. Like it doesn't feel like it gets resolved. Diane clearly has like very ill feelings against her sister. But I don't, and maybe I just missed it, but like, I don't catch why. No. It, it feels like Valerie feel, is acting like Diane, Diane's mother. And it's almost like Diane's running from her. Exactly. And so the only thing, oh, the, the only thing that we get here is that we get that we know that Tubbs and Valerie met because they were both cops in New York. So that's how they, they know each other. Clearly they had a relationship before then too they don't necessarily go into detail on that but we just know based on how they're acting we also don't get any reason or any ex- explanation as to why valerie was at the crime scene how did she know what was going on over there how did how did she know to go there when when the scene when they were pulling a body out of the river there's no explanation as why valerie was there she's just 
that good a cop, maybe? Is that just how they make him in New York? I don't know. Maybe. Isn't Tubbs from New York? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, that, that that's what I'm saying. Well, I'm just saying, I mean, if Tubbs is also from New York, if he was a better detective, he might have known that she was here. True. Well, I believe that they don't part on the best of terms. So, and he's also, he's been in Miami now for a while, and it's mm-hmm. not like he's making any reasonable efforts to reach Pam back in, uh, back in New York. No. What do you it, think it was? What, what do you think caused the relationship to end? Do you have any guesses? Why? They talk about it in the episode. Uh, one of the times when they're laying in bed, she, they said, they talk about how, like, their jobs just got in between them. Both of them are just too serious a cop. Yeah, they're jobs. Mm-hmm. It's not it's not Tubbs. The fact that he tries to swallow everyone's <laughs> face that he kisses. It's not his it, like horrible sweating problem. <laughs> A glandular <laughs> issue, really. Well, let, on with not knowing why Diane knew where the crime scene was and not knowing why Tubbs has such a sweat problem. Let's jump to another scene that has that makes no sense. That there was no build up to it. It just happens. We go we go back to David's house. David is having another orgy hooker party at his house, which looks like is that not saying he's having him at his house? That's just like where he runs his business. Is 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 out the, of that house? And I no, it's not modeling, his house either. Huh? The modeling agency. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's also not his house, right? Because in the end of the episode, they're in some apartment. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's almost like just like some kind of private club or something that they use. But it it, it looks like a house. It it definitely is a house. And and you know what I think it is is it's it's that it's the house from Calderon's return. It's McCarthy's house. Oh, yeah. I knew I recognized it. I thought it was Calderon's, but yes, you're right. It's McCarthy's. Doesn't house. it look just like McCarthy's house? That's, it does. Well, that's what I thought. I don't know for sure if it is, but it yeah. looks just like it. It does. It looks exactly like McCarthy's house. This, I guess, this is the scene where the B team gets a chance to kind of redeem themselves. So we go back to the party, David's house. It's full of hookers and high end clientele. And I forgot to mention that because there's a gentleman named Roberto. That is a key aspect to this story. And in the first, in the opening, in the scene where they're at David's house, David has a conversation with, with Ro- Roberto. Roberto is a routine customer of David's. So now the B team and, comes into the... And apparently he's a routine actor on the show as well. Yeah, apparently Roberto is also the li- sinister limo driver from Little Prince. Hmm. And oh, we see him again is. as one of the henchmen in, in another future episode. But in this episode, he's a diplomat. He's got diplomatic immunity. Hell of a step up from driving limos. <laughs> and murdering people who run the jug side of the business. The B team comes in and they, they just like bust in, right? They just like kick the, the no, they knock on the door, right? So on the they push their way in and they're like. They quiz that girl where they're like, oh, we think you have a bug problem. And they make her open her mouth and they're like, oh, no, can't help that. <laughs> <laughs> See, I told you, I, I was telling you guys before the show that I actually did get a chuckle out of the B team in this scene because they're going around acting like in supposed exterminators, but they're just spraying. People all through the party with yeah. this random mist, yeah. and they're making these these funny comments like that. I actually did, did get a chuckle. I did find them somewhat funny during. This yeah, so scene. they have like these comically large spray systems that just puts out like smoke, and and inside of one of them is like a big cancer. It's got a camera, so it's it's the eighties. Modern cameras fit inside of glasses, right? Yeah. And look like normal glasses. In the eighties, he's carrying a suitcase with a hole with a hole the size of a pancake in it, <laughs> <laughs> and holding it up to people's faces so that we can get video as they walk around the room saying jokes about how they found big bugs and they're gonna they they're have gonna a six legged plague. <laughs> <laughs> eventually Lyle comes down and kicks them out of the house and they don't put up much of a fight they just the only thing they're doing is they are trying to get on video everyone that's inside of the house okay yeah. so i have i have questions though as as fun as the scene was how how did they know to go to, to go to david's house they, oh they, they mention it they mention that um gina got an invite uh because she's got a in there right yeah um, that she got an invite to the to a very exclusive party, and they're just gonna drop by. Mm. Though I don't know why they don't go with Gina. So what are they investigating? Are they investigating the dead hooker they pulled out of the water, or is this a totally separate investigation that Gina has been working on? Did Gina meet Lyle? Is that how she got the invite? I don't know. It's it's just like you. There's a scene where the B team are like getting set up to like go in, and they mention like. 
oh yeah, they uh, Gina's got some invite to a very exclusive party, and we're just going to drop by tonight. So yeah, yeah. There's no this. That, so it sounds like they're doing another investigation that Gina has been working on the street trying to figure out who these pimps are and has gotten an invitation. Well, and clearly they don't make the connection, right? Because uh, uh, Valerie ends up back in and she's just like snacking on something or like hanging out at the precinct. And uh, Crockett well, is like... she's hanging out because she's there with her man. <laughs> <laughs> so, because well, we're going to get there. Let's first get there. But, okay. Cro- but Crockett is like really flippant about it where he's like, oh, you got to see their, their newest film or whatever, right? Which is evidence that's inadmissible to court, right? He yeah. says that. No yeah. warrant, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and what's funny is that the when they bring up the fact that it's inadmissible, not only Crockett, Tubbs, and even Castile like, has a little bit of a laugh about it. Yeah. Like, oh, 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 you silly guys. You can't <laughs> use any of this. Well, let's get there. Let's get to that preceding scene. But first... Let's not. Let's skip this. <laughs> we have to go to Valerie's hotel. No, Valerie's has been in town for a we while. Don't. Apparently, Tubbs and Valerie have been hanging out all day. It's now this evening. We get to Valerie's hotel, and Valerie is talking about she's concerned for her sister, and she's talking to Tubbs, who is in her room with her. I want to know what love is. <laughs> hey, we're not there yet. We're not there yet. That scene gave me all the feels. <laughs> <laughs> and there's like no middle ground for Tubbs here. He just like gets an erection in the middle of the conversation and decides to just go for it. He just like jumps on Valerie and Valerie doesn't seem okay with this. No. She doesn't seem okay with his advancements on her in this room. Yeah. I mean, throughout the entire episode, I mean, even later in the episode when they are some, when they are a couple, she never looks comfortable with it. No. And and so in this scene, we get that, we get a little bit of the backstory. Like they've known each other for a long time. They had a previous relationship. There's a brief mention of like that their jobs, that what had happened to them is that their jobs had gotten in the way. And then eventually they've been hugging and like little kissing. And then Valerie eventually says like, no, I think I want you to stay. And Tubbs gets this, like, giant shit-eating grin on his face. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's it's like that saying of, like, a hundred, like 99 no's and one yes is still one yes. That was essentially the look that Tubbs got on his face <laughs> when he said, I want you to stay. And this goes from Tubbs smiling to boning down real fast. Now, this is a short sex scene, Jenna. But I want you to describe the slow-mo that we get of Tubbs and Pam Greer, who I have said is this. She looks amazing in this. She is beautiful. Yeah. She's so far her scenes has been well acted as well. I believe her as a cop more than I believe Tubbs is a cop. I believe her as she sells to Tubbs that he's doing something right, okay? <laughs> but like you can see how dead her eyes are in it, okay? But <laughs> She looks fine. The problem is, is that you get slow mo, sweaty tubs leaning in where he's like, he's rubbing that hairy chest all over her face, trying to like <laughs> kiss her cheeks and her forehead. And like, it's not romantic at all. It's actually just really creepy. And then he goes in for the actual kiss, which she's all already like half swallowed his necklace. <laughs> and <laughs> actually just trying to fight for breath. And then they just, they, they just make out a cut scene. It's a real short sex scene. But John, you were saying that it's short for a reason. It is short for a reason because apparently the network saw it before they aired it and felt like it was too explicit. And so they made them cut it down shorter. Basically, they made them cut out the awkward parts, if you could do believe you think, it. Do you think it was more graphic or it was normal Miami Vice sex and the network's like, we can't have any more tub sex scenes? <laughs> I, I, I think it made the network executive sad. I just want to know, like, for, so from the great McCarthy, when... Tubbs is like where we go through that really awkward, very elongated foreplay, and they didn't think that that like that like slow. I'm gonna like leap at you and like bite you like a cobra, <laughs> like, <laughs> kissing style. If that was okay, like it's clearly just Pam at this point where they were like, whoa, whoa, you guys, this is too much. Yeah, she's a lady, <laughs> and, and apparently this is so we can't always bag on tubs because apparently the studio stepped in during a Crockett sex scene later in the seasons. How so dare they? That was going to be my next question. Why do we have so many tub sex scenes and almost no Crockett love stories? Right. I'm still waiting for a quality Crockett and Gina scene. Bad news, but we'll get to that later. 
<laughs> what, what the hell? Apparently, according to my sources, there is very few stories that involve Crockett in a love interest throughout the entire run of the show. Well, I'm going to flip the table. I'm done. <laughs> we don't even need to finish this season. This podcast is over. Maybe he's shy. I came in Maybe ready to Maybe he swings ship. a different way. I was talking to my sources, and I was saying that I'm, t- I'm, I'm tired of dir- dirty cop episodes. We finally have one that's not about some shady cop that's inside of the Miami Police Department. So I'm happy for that. But I'm also sad when it's not a story that is Crockett-centric. Crockett- Crockett-centric stories, because it's not necessarily just love interests. Anyone who he latches on to, he latches on emotionally really fast. He takes things super personal when that happens. As we know with the two college kids who are going to try and pick up cocaine in Columbia. So in the milk run, Crockett latches on to one of the characters really hard, right? Yeah, like he's, he becomes, like he cares so deep about him. And what makes the episode good at the end is like you see Crockett sad because it feels like he let him down. That there was a, there was a chance for that kid that he was going to be okay. And so, but he gets like that with a number of people, but this is like key Crockett, right? Like he reached out for, let's say like Candy James, mm-hmm. Bruce Willis's wife. Uh, yeah, but but with Candy, he didn't he didn't care about Candy. He actually wanted her to leave. Candy was the one that was pushing that. That's why I loved her so much. No, but he really, like he did, he was looking out for her. Like he wanted her to leave because he wanted her to be safe. Mm-hmm. So and her continued meddling was putting her further in jam- in danger. Either way, I want stories where Crockett is doing stuff regardless of the consequences, regardless of what's going to happen to his badge, and Tubbs is just like, "That's my man. I I may disagree, but I'm gonna go with him." Yeah, I mean, so when we started off this whole thing, Crockett was painted as this guy who clearly was like struggling with the way that the job was wearing him down, that he Mm -hmm. seriously was was, costing him his marriage. He was having trouble distinguishing himself between who he played out on the street when he was working vice. And then like his personal life and who he really was and like finding that identity. In short, he was a drunk. And I feel like we haven't, we haven't really approached that at all in several episodes. No, no. So, you know, not to drone on that too much. I know as they're still in the first season and that the show gets so popular that every story essentially becomes a Crockett story because yeah. Don Johnson is the, he ends up being the superstar of Miami Vice and Philip Michael Thomas ends up being working for some psychic network. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, this is when we go back to the scene that you were talking about, John, where obviously Valerie and Tubbs stay the night. Crockett comes in the next, in the, Precinct the next morning. Valerie is already sitting at the desk. She's going through paperwork. We assume she's still looking for Diane. Has nothing to do with the current investigation into David's house where the B team had gone in there and illegally filmed everyone inside of the home with no warrant. And we are not privy as viewers to this investigation. This is not part of the plot as far as the investigation goes. It seems completely separate, and everyone is aware that they can't use any of this. It's all just like lead gen at this point. Yeah. Well, and there's some good laughing cu- coming from the room. And Crockett just says offhanded, like, hey, you should go in there and see the latest footage from the B team. And so they both go into the room. Tub still isn't there. But so Valerie and Crockett go into the room. Playing on the screen is the video footage from the suitcase that Switek was carrying around inside. You could probably hear him groaning under the weight of the suitcase as he carried it around. <laughs> it pans through the crowd. And, of course, who's there? Roberto? And Diane. Diane. And now Valerie is crushed because now she knows what Diane is up to. It is clear she is working as a prostitute at this home. uh, And Valerie, I mean, and uh, Roberto is one of her clients. Meanwhile, Diane is spending the day out shopping in what is also a wonderful 80s shopping montage. (laughs) It's actually probably one of the best actual montages we've had in the show. Oh, yeah. like Because it's. She's like posing like in the mirror with herself and shows like like the serious look and then she laughs and then like back to serious or like sultry kind of look, you know, then like the Julia Roberts Pretty Woman. Pretty woman type changing yeah. clothes and, and finding stuff. So I it, want to talk about the pickle montage. pants. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you ever want to know how bad the clothes were in the eighties, watch this shopping montage with the pickle pants and 
The polka dot dress. <laughs> but she gets that zebra, that sequin zebra dress. And I loved that dress. <laughs> that dress was awesome. <laughs> and so in between all this, she is doing a ton of cocaine. Oh, yes. and so is Lyle. And Lyle's just, so they have like, like in the mirror scene. So while, like one of the mirror scenes where she steps away and it's just Lyle. And Lyle's repeated like 80 times and he's just looking at himself like I've done way too much <laughs> coke right now. And Lyle's like, is Lyle like her personal shopper? Like, is is he assigned to her from David to all to to monitor her? What's weird is that it seems like she has a stronger relationship with John Turturro's character, and is like clearly he like they are sleeping together. Yeah. And so then it's like, was she sleeping with Lyle and him, or I guess is Lyle just like. The like the ugly wingman friend that's not getting any action, but is having to put in like the leg work of like, he's the super happy. he's the Robin to Batman. He yeah. has to go do all the grunt work. Yeah, he does all the grunt work. He only hangs out with Toretto so that he can occasionally get get action from some of the prostitutes. Is is the, what I'm thinking. You you get some through association. Are you saying Toretto or you mean Totoro? Totoro. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Tuturo. Yeah. Just just making sure. Um. So okay. After this great. Shopping montage. We go to the duo and Valerie. They go to meet up with Roberto, who they saw in the video was with Diane at the at the hooker house. Where we learn that he has diplomatic immunity. <laughs> yeah, so they just barge in. Still no warrant. There's, there's no reason. There's nothing that they can use on tape that uh, against him in court or anything. They barge past the secretary, go into his office, and start showing him pictures from the video of him at the party. And he's saying like, I have diplomatic community. I like to hang out with friends. This doesn't mean anything. And they just basically say like, hey, this is a known place for where uh, high-end clientele go to pick up hookers. But he doesn't seem that concerned about whatever the vice team is showing him. And this is uh, where Crockett dropped one of my favorite lines of the episode. Hands off the threads, toots. Why don't you go make some coffee? (laughs) Wow. So wow. that's going to make it hard. <laughs> so, yeah, there's that. And you were wondering why Don Johnson doesn't have very many sex scenes. <laughs> <laughs> Eventually, Valerie says, like, hey, it's my daughter. It's not my daughter. It's my sister that's with you in that picture. And Roberto kind of has a moment of clarity. And he says, you want to talk to David? I believe they call it a come to Jesus moment. <laughs> I and believe he's just everyone, feels, he just feels guilty about all the dirty, dirty things he did to her sister. <laughs> everyone has it when they look at Pam Greer in the face. <laughs> True. And so R- Roberto even call, like Crockett tells him he has to call David. And so he calls him. And I forget what the phone call was for. So, But anyways, I don't think it's of much... Con- no, that's what it is. He says that basically he's inviting some new people out to the house. Yeah, meaning yeah. Tubbs so, and Crockett. Saying that like he's got some new high, like, high-end like high clientele. And they need like the best girls available. And so then we go to a great scene with John Turturro uh, as David. And this is where we see... like a cl- It's actually like a classic story about how uh, these people in real life convince girls to become prostitutes. She's she's laying in bed. John Turturro is up in like a robe. He's wa- he's wa- walking around. And she's like, listening to music. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And he's asking her about like how was the shopping and stuff like that. And she's clearly all in on it. And he's giving her drugs too. And this is like in real life. This is close as we get to what it's like for human traffic. They take these girls. They wine and dine them and get them addicted to drugs. Oh, and yeah. Then they're, and then they're in too deep. Yeah. And it's funny because she makes a comment that almost you can almost see it flip a switch in his head when she says i don't really need you Mm -hmm. and when she says that you you see the change in his face and he instantly just grabs her yeah Yeah. he 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 gets mad at her says don't treat me like one of like one of your johns like don't try and and sell it to me like you're like i like i need to work for you or anything like that Mm -hmm. and it's just an amazing transformation because he goes from the nice guy that she knows who's whining and dining her and being her best buddy and and business partner to instantly snaps in the pimp mode and you see how how dangerous and hostile he can be yeah and the smoothness that Totoro has with slipping in and out of this because as soon as he makes his point and then he and then he stands up and he's just right back cool and calm and he does it so well that it's like even and and i think that uh that diane like the woman who plays diane does a really good job with this too because you can see that she's like 
thrown off and rattled, but still trying to like recover where it's like, oh, that didn't happen. Like, that's not whatever. Like, this is cool and fun and, and like just better. Yeah, it rattled, wasn't serious. Cool. Yeah, it wasn't serious. He's just playing around. Yeah. So now we go to later that night. And this is when Thompson Crockett go to David's hooker parlor, you know, <laughs> bunny ranch, the whatever. Emporium. Yeah, yeah, whatever it is. <laughs> David's pussy, pussy, and more. <laughs> <laughs> There's one of those wild waving inflatable tube men outfit. <laughs> the duo's there because they're on recommendation from Roberto. David comes down and meets them as soon as they walk inside. Basically, like, like, hey, have a good time. Let let me know if you need anything. And there, they have a Crockett and or Tubbs just has a wire. And there he's able to come to com- communicate with Valerie and the B team that are sitting out in a van outside that can hear what's happening inside of the party. And this is a very strange scene because it starts out like it's an undercover sting, but turns into a kidnapping very quickly. Yes, and, and that's just like a perfect time to talk about that. The entire Vice team is invested in helping Valerie find her sister under no regular investigation. They are just doing this out of the kindness of their heart. This is not part of some bigger investigation. I guess it is because it's at David's place. So maybe they'll find some more in- some more information or anything like that. But technically, what they're doing with helping Valerie isn't solving any crimes that they're and, currently, and, that they're actively working on. And honestly, it's not actually helping the ca- their case at all because I mean, at this point, they know David, they think David to be a pimp, but they have no evidence of anything. And any evidence that they've gotten is totally inadmissible to court. Yeah, and so here they are and you think the it, with an undercover sting like they would have to solicit solicit a prostitute and try and get them to either turn or try and get incriminating evidence no they just start going through the party looking for diane's sister val sorry valerie's sister diane without they don't they don't talk to david at all they just start searching tubs goes upstairs and crockett kind of slinks around the party which we get a nice little cutaway of a very very tall, we'll, we'll say woman. Um, <laughs> I'm not 100% positive on that. Well, yeah, I mean, because, like, Tubbs is walking around looking for Diane. And Crockett is just, every time he turns around, there's another woman who's trying to pick up on him. And he is, he seems like he's totally overwhelmed with, with what's happening. Like, right. if there wasn't for the wire, Crockett was staying all night. <laughs> yes. And when this tall woman whispers in his ear, he goes, I, I can't do that. I have a trick knee. <laughs> well, eventually, in Tubbs is snooping around the house, he finds Valerie, who is doing more coke inside of a room. Now, unfortunately, he's wearing that wire, so now Valerie can hear everything in the conversation that's happening between Diane and Tubbs. Tubbs tells Diane, like, you need to come with me. I'm a vice cop. Your sister is worried about you. I'm taking you out of here. Diane's like, I'm not going anywhere. I'm having a good time. I don't, I'm not listening to you or my sister or what anyone has to say. And Tubbs just grabs her. Right. Like, so she's an adult. She, if she was in college, she should be of age so that if she doesn't consent to this and they don't have anything where they could reasonably arrest her, which I guess I, I mean, I assume that the Coke in front of her would be enough that they could theoretically warrant some level of arrest just like on like possession or whatever but he just but he doesn't do any of that like it's purely just to take her back to her sister yeah yeah and if they were gonna arrest her they would throw the cuffs on her and arrest her they he picks her up like fireman carries her out of the building and i mean obviously if he had just flat out arrested her they would have blown whatever investigation we don't know about you know so i mean it is it almost blows their cover but at the same time, yeah, there's there's no real arrest here. They, he just kidnaps her. Yeah, and then they get back into the van, and Diane's just screaming at Valerie, like, you ruin everything. I didn't want you to come find me. Leave me alone. Well, Valerie drops a tubs worthy bitch slap on diane <laughs> in the back of that van and diane finally calms down she just starts collapses and cries right and unfortunately valerie not only did she have to do that to her own sister but then she heard the conversation with tubs inside of the house too of her saying like i don't need my sister and i'm gonna do whatever the hell i want to so yeah. things are rough between diane and valerie at this point we go to and then now we have 
is it the next morning? It might be a couple of days later. The timeline's unclear at this point, like how many, how long it's been. Valerie is going to see Diane, who's at like a hospital rehab center slash hospital, and they go to talk. And this scene is really weird. It, it's I'm not gonna get too detailed on what's happening, but basically Valerie says like, "Hey, I've been looking for you for six months. I've been concerned about you." Diane says like, "My life's been one one solid party. I never wanted you to find me." And then Valerie says, "This is what I spend one to spend most of my time on." Valerie says like, "Look, I'm done." You're an adult. I'm done trying to be your mom. Whatever you want to do with your life, you go ahead and do it. It's like, wait a minute. You just soaked up all of the resources of the Miami Vice Department to find her. And then the first thing you say is like, I can't control you. You go do whatever you want to. Well, not just this. I mean, think about how this affects Diane because she just ruined her relationship with her pimp. And if that's what she wanted to do, well, she can't go back there now. So, I mean, it's almost like Valerie and the rest of the Vice team don't understand the risk that they put Diane in by doing all of this. And then by saying like, oh, but but you could just go do whatever you want to. And you would assume with all of the people that the Vice Squad has lost up to this point, like they would really understand that how much danger she might be in right now, especially since they just pulled a dead hooker out of the water. Right. So, I mean, it eventually ends with like Diane makes the right decision. Diane says, I like I I don't do anything I don't want. Right. Mm -hmm. And and Valerie drops some knowledge on her where. I, it, it makes Diane think twice, right? And and so Valerie leaves and Diane continues to sort of think on it, pray mm-hmm. on it, come to Jesus. Diane also tells Valerie, and this, this is just a side note, that she's making $1,000 a night, which I seem to remember him saying she was going to make $10,000 a week. That's one hell of a profit margin. Well, no, I, I, I'm, I'm sitting here counting the days. There's seven days in a week, which means she's making about seven grand, which means she must be the discount because that's about three grand out of ten grand. I don't know. Maybe my math's not right. Is she the discount? Hooker? It sounds like David has an Apple level of fees that he takes from <laughs> Diane as she's working. He's keeping 30%. If he's only taking 30%, then he's actually a pretty fair pimp because I, 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 I was under the impression pimps take most of the money. <laughs> we go back to the precinct and this is this this was a good scene we go back to and Tubbs and crockett are arguing they're having like a vehement argument there in the uh in that meeting room and castillo's just there like snack he's eating his lunch snacking <laughs> like they, while they're they having... now only eat lunch together <laughs> yeah. you What's know happening? castillo's thinking in his head too like damn it i just want to eat my freaking sandwich and these fuckers won't leave <laughs> Even Pam at the end of the table is just like, I'm not even getting involved in this. They're talking about my sister and her yeah. case, but whatever. And I'm only, th- I'm thinking the whole time, it's like, why are mommy and daddy fighting? <laughs> <laughs> why are they so mad? What's weird is that Crockett is being very not Crockett like because he's saying we have to use her, convince her to talk. No, and here's where I'll argue, and Tubbs has a great line. So I'm thinking Crockett is being normal Miami Vice. And what's different here is that Tubbs is involved with the person who they are using in the investigation. Crockett is saying, like, we have to use Diane. We have to, like, put her back into that house. That way we we can catch David, essentially. Use her to wear a wire or something like that to get her back into the house. Like the Vice team normally does, right? But Tubbs is saying, like, no, we can't do that. And he says, quote, why can't we ever help someone without expecting them to return the favor? Exactly, Miami Vice. Why do you go to help someone who's, like, stuck? And then the first thing you ask them is like okay now the next thing you're gonna do is you're gonna go back to those people <laughs> wearing a wire and we're gonna be positioned nine blocks away <laughs> and you know somewhere truly sitting there like they're not there they're not gonna help you they're gonna you're gonna end up tied up next to a bomb i'm telling you we've also recently been through budget cuts so the guy who does your wire is probably gonna it's gonna be starting to play the music from the radio or something we've i'm only just how that happened once i'm it's just totally wondering fine. how often do tubs and crockett eat lunch with castillo seems kind of random seems like ever since golden triangle castillo has been buddy buddy with to- crockett and tubs like they're almost getting special treatment you well know? as we saw in in smugglers blues it's a boys club now yeah he, like, i mean they absolutely are getting special treatment yeah yeah absolutely so and this ev- eventually ends with castillo saying like valerie what, what do you think we should do and valerie says i think you've used my sister enough tubs and 
Valerie leave. Crockett's upset because the things aren't going to go his way. We go back to the hospital and Diane is, she's decided that she's going to go back to New York. She calls David, tells David like, hey, look, I think you're a nice guy. Sorry things didn't work out, but I'm going to go back to New York. And Turturro plays that perfect. He's like, oh, I'm really going to miss you. I'm sorry you have to go. Didn't we have a good time? Didn't you like the shopping? Didn't you like all the stuff that we did together? And Diane's like, yeah, you know what? You were great. And David's like, well, let me come see you one more time before you leave. Yeah, don't be afraid if I try or don't, don't blame me if I try to convince you to stay. Yeah, he just like, he lays it on thick. And of course, Diane buys it hook, line, and sinker. And gives him the address on exactly where she is. That way they can have that goodbye. And of course, what does David do? Gives the address to Lyle and tells Lyle, go take care of her. Now we have we have one of those classic Miami Vice scenes where we go back and forth. So now we have Tubbs and Valerie. They're in bed together. Now, mind you, no one is watching Diane at the hospital. There's no security there. They stole her from a known violent pimp. And there's no security at the hospital. We have... Valerie and Tubbs laying in bed together, canoodling. We- <laughs> I want to know what love is. We're finally there. We're finally there. <laughs> and I want you to... We go to Lyle, who's walking through the hospital, wearing a fantastic white suit. Nice flowers for Diane, assuming that he's going to go say goodbye for David. While- and Diane inside of the hospital room. Pick while- up his dry cleaning. <laughs> go here, Lyle. Go there, Lyle. <laughs> I'll, show, <laughs> I'll show David. It's very much that Tubbs and Valerie have fallen into themselves now. Yeah. They they are very they found that they have rekindled what they had. They're very happy to be with them. Valerie is even saying in the conversation with him, like she's thinking about that she would just stay there. That may, maybe they would at, at, not, now that this is over, she would just stay in Miami. Another New York officer who just decides to relocate themselves. Yeah. Because yeah. that's how it works. It doesn't, you don't have to actually apply for that or get some sort of a formal transfer. You just continue to show up at the Miami Police Department's office. And exactly. They, you, they just let you in. Let yeah. you is, is this common practice? Like if I was a cop and I went to Cleveland and started hanging out with Cleveland cops, I could just like, oh, I'm one of you now. <laughs> right. I work here. Well, about halfway through this back and forth, we see Diane at the hospital with Lyle walking up to her, and we have Valerie and Tubbs laying in bed together. The music starts to build. It's foreigner. I want to know what love is. It's like perfect for the scene because they're the, these old flames have gotten together. They feel like everything in their life has finally coming together. The the hardship of the last six months for Valerie, Tubbs losing Valerie all those months ago, maybe years ago, Valerie finding her sister, she's alive and healthy, that everything is going good. The music builds. Foreigners, I Want to Know Love Is, is an amazing song that's playing. And of course, Lyle gets into the room and injects Diane with something that kills her. While Valerie and Tubbs are laying in bed, Crockett is at the scene of the hospital as the ambulances are going in there to go get Diane's body. And he has to make that call to Tubbs to tell him that Diane has been found dead. You know, and I actually, all joking aside, I actually really felt for Crockett in, in this moment because you can see the the difficulty he's having in making that phone call because he he knows what he knows that Tubbs is going to be with her and he knows mm-hmm. what that she's going to be she's going to be crushed when she finds out about her sister and you can see he's really uh, forcing himself just to make the phone call. Well, he feels for both of them, right? Because he has to tell Tubbs, and then Tubbs is going to have to immediately tell Valerie. Right, and he's still on the phone with Tubbs when, and like, hears him begin to tell Valerie, and like, that's just got to be horrible. Like, he knows that he knows that this is different. That this is not just losing any normal person from a case. It's just that much worse. This is as personal as it can get. Right. Well, I don't want to drone on too long about that scene because we will talk more about the music when the music section comes up. Like, it was just that scene was perfect. It was it. it it hit the, all the right notes. We know that at times Miami Vice has a hard time signaling when something sad happens. And this just hit all the right notes, right? Music, right actors, right scenes. You know, it was just, it was perfect all the way around. Absolutely. Back at the precinct, Castillo and the duo are, have brought in David. And we just have a short scene here where they are, they are interrogating David. And basically what happens here is not to go into too much detail on it. It's just that Tubbs Tubbs flies off the handle. David is kind of poking at him and Tubbs flies off the handle and Castillo gets really pissed off at Tubbs. He's like, don't ever do that shit again. 
in, inside while, while you're doing interrogating because he lunges at David after David says like I'm sorry basically like I'm sorry for your loss like wink wink and Tubbs lunge at him they have to stop him from attacking him and, and the only thing of importance that we get here is that Valerie tells Tubbs hey don't let David off on a technicality. Be a good cop on this investigation. Don't fuck this up because I'm leaving. This is your investigation. Yeah, so uh, my my issue with this scene is a small one, but it's with the uh, supposed highest price lawyer uh, mm-hmm. money can buy who seems to not understand that libel is only when you print something <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, negative about someone but seems to think that he's going to put a suit forward for libel and assault uh <laughs> toward miami vice for tubbs treatment of his client so that's not how this works <laughs> no no i mean i i don't remember seeing a scene where tubbs was putting up liars about um roberto <laughs> so i don't think uh libel will work and i think assault's a little bit of a stretch i don't think i don't think he like straight out punched him or anything so yeah apparently the highest priced lawyer in miami is a little bit above florida level (laughs) about florida level yeah yeah a little bit above your lower level like a paralegal almost yeah well we go from there to the airport and this is where Tubbs and crockett are saying goodbye to valerie she's going back to new york we see the casket being loaded into the airplane valerie says a short goodbye to Crockett, and then there's a little bit longer goodbye with Tubbs. Tubbs is obviously hurt that Valerie is leaving. He want, he really wanted her to stay. And Valerie just says, like, hey, I need, I don't want to be around anyone. I'm leaving. I'm going to go stay with my friend, Billy. Valerie just basically says that she's going, she wants to be left alone. Tubbs is heartbroken, obviously, and Crockett is doing like what he's supposed to do. He's, we get the sense that they're best friends now after, as like a <laughs> stepbrothers type movement where they didn't like each other. Did we just other. become best friends? <laughs> yeah. Crockett's just there to give him moral support. Tubbs standing at the window making like the sign of the cross as the, as the casket gets loaded. Because, yeah. you know, before he was a cop, he was in seminary school. <laughs> we go back to the precinct and Tubbs is just like he's got head down working he's making phone calls Castillo comes in Crockett's at his desk Castillo comes in Crockett and Castillo walk away from the desk Castillo's like hey we we identified the body that we pulled out of the water finally and he asks like how Tubbs is doing and then Tubbs gets he, while he's on the phone he all of a sudden just slams the receiver down and starts running out from his desk Crockett just runs off after him the ice cream man's outside <laughs> the as we know what happens is is that he gets gets a call from Billy and Billy said hey the casket showed up but Valerie didn't show up on the airplane so she's gone rogue yeah he knows where Valerie's going. We all know where Valerie's going. Valerie's going to do some vigilante justice on David. Oh, I thought she was going to try and make $10,000 uh, $10, a week. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to point out that I'm pretty sure in this scene, Tubbs is eating an orange. And he's eating it like an apple. He has, like, <laughs> just taken a bite out of the orange and is eating it. So it's like... like chunks missing like an apple but he's eating the orange that way i don't know tubbs is just he's just slightly off (laughs) (laughs) he's 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 a a weird guy he's a weird guy and this is when we get to the closing scene tubbs and crockett are racing to david's apartment valerie is already there i'm surprised they didn't do like the like the double cut where like you see her continue to go and and like more of them racing well they did do a little bit of it yeah. And the scenes that, but the scenes that they use of them driving across town to get there were from the pilot. It's the exact same footage from the pilot, from part two of the pilot, where they're driving to the final shootout. How low budget is this show? I don't know, that but they like reuse footage. They sign the same people to play different characters. I feel like we're watching a high school play. Yeah, because one of the scenes is that side in the front of the car along the side where you see the front wheel. Yeah. Like that's the shot that they use. Yeah, it was uh, it. Was NBC having a hard time back then? Maybe. Because uh, that's just so odd. I mean, always, uh, I, I guess guess they've always just tried to save a dollar. I mean, I thought it was weird this year that they closed the Olympics with a performance by the judges from The Voice. <laughs> um, but I guess they just try and save money whenever they can. Yeah, so Valerie's there at the apartment already. And so she knocks on the door. A bodyguard opens the door. And she is, does she pull a gun on him? And she beats him up, kind of, right? No, she, she pulls, pulls a gun, a gun on, on him. Yeah. 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 But he doesn't say anything. He just starts backing up. No, yeah, she pulls a gun on him. And he backs up. And then... David shoots him. No, Lyle. 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 Lyle shoots. Lyle shoots and he misses Valerie and shoots the bodyguard. Valerie then returns fire and shoots Lyle. 
I really Miles wish they town. were all wearing name tags at this <laughs> point. <laughs> and then she kicks off her shoes. Mm-hmm. At this point, David's calling out to Lyle to see if he's still like if he's okay and how mm-hmm. many he's saying how many how many are there so that he can get a gauge for like how badass he needs to be like yeah. is this one gun or a two gun show how yeah. many I'll tell you how many Jackie Brown that's <laughs> how many uh, Valerie has backed him into a corner he's got nowhere else to go she's like leaning up against the wall and she's gonna re- get ready to pop out and, and the best scene ever Lyle all of a sudden Lyle just, like single jumps into the back of the frame and hits the side of the wall in the in the hallway and he's gonna shoot valerie in yes. the back she's gonna she came there to kill david and she's gonna die in the process but the guys break in and shoot lyle and do they shoot david too no she they, shoots david. she then rolls out and shoots and kills david and so the, the fact that they showed up, does that all of a sudden make this a justified shooting? No, because... But she knows it, too, mm-hmm. because as soon as things, like, have a second to settle, and they know it, too, like, Tubbs is just, like, you can see it on his face, like, he's crushed that and they Crockett didn't get there And Crockett is, time. like, staring at David like he's never seen a dead body before. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and she immediately hands over her gun and says, like, arrest, read me, arrest me, she read says, me my rights. Read me my rights. Yep. And that's the end of the episode. Surprise, Valerie actually makes it through, kills David, now that now she's going to prison for murder. Which is part for the course for the Miami department. At True. this point, they've had a number of significant like family members of people who were wronged and And who anyone who killed. commits a mid to high level crime just gets killed in the street. Yep. And doesn't actually go to jail. Yep. So that's gonna pretty much wrap it up for the rundown. There's a um there's a fair amount of music in this episode for a change, unlike some of the episodes where you get maybe one song. So let's uh let's go on and talk about the music. So yeah, yeah, there's actually uh, unlike the a uh, couple of the last or like last week when there was only two songs, we had about five or six songs this week. Damn. Yeah, they broke it out, and so we start with "Come to Papa" by Bob Seger off of the amazing Night Moves album from '76. Mm. Uh, and this is during the open with Diane walking down the beach. And I'm not going to spend too much time because I want to get to some of the other music here. We all know Bob Seger. We all know he's awesome. So the the next song I want to talk about is Change Your Ways by Rockwell. Rockwell, his real name is Kennedy William Gordon. He is the son of Motown fan founder Barry Gordon, who named him a- after a combination of John F. Kennedy and William Smokey Robinson. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Strong start. So Rockwell is a son of industry giant when mm-hmm. it comes to music, but he decided he wanted to get a record deal without his dad's help. So behind his dad's back, got a record deal and subsequently made a bunch of music with a bunch of really famous people right off the bat. Like the first single he released featured Michael Jackson with Jermaine Jackson backing up vocals. Damn. I mean, that's a hell of a start. Yeah. Basically, Rockwell was kind of a mid-level artist, never really did anything to really put him up there or separate him probably why if if you're listening to this you probably don't know who he is but change of ways is on his album somebody's watching me and just a little bit wait is he the guy like i always feel like somebody's watching me what wait, wait what is that now i feel like i've just said something that's like way more famous than yeah this i mean guy. no no but you're right that's just, it's it's him but it's that him. part that you remember is actually sung by michael jackson Yes. Oh, yeah, okay, good. Because so while I was saying it, I was thinking, wait, Jenna, stop, stop. This is a Michael Jackson song. No, 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 no. no. That is very appropriate because I was just talked about the first song being with Michael Jackson with Jermaine on backup vocals. But I didn't say what song it was. And I'm glad you did sing a little bit because I think people would recognize it. (laughs) Um, You're welcome, everybody. But yeah, so that is a singing episode, by the way. (laughs) Yes. Yes. So, but yes, that was also by that was by rockwell and just a little side note he is also the half brother of red foo uh from lmfao oh 
which means his nephew is sky blue of the same. <laughs> so like, we just both had the exact same face. We we're like red. Oh, what? Yes. So the, a very famous family of musicians there. I'm going to really quick. So we're going to jump to I Want to Know What Love Is by Foreigner. Because amazing. It's amazing. Just amazing. So good. Have you seen, on, on, on a side note, have you seen Foreigner recently? No. Okay. They, there's videos, full concerts to them on YouTube at like 2013, 2014, 2015. They still look and sound amazing. Really? Yeah. Like, See, I they know. have not missed a beat. Well, the crazy thing is, yeah, the crazy thing is they're still releasing albums. They're very much like ACDC where we're like 15 albums deep and they're Mm -hmm. still going. But I want to know what Love is on their album. Agent Provocateur uh, was released in November 1984 and reached number one on both the UK and US charts and is damn straight. It is their biggest hit. That they ever released. If I was to make like a list of songs, I would say like, hey, so if you were to make five songs, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, aughts, teens, that define that that decade, I want to know Love is by Foreigner is one of those five songs. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I would agree. So, yeah, this is it actually turned out to be their biggest hit. In fact, it is such a amazing popular song. That throughout the early 2000s, it kept charting on adult contemporary charts, <laughs> uh, even landing it at number one at a certain point, which tells it you that. It must have been in a movie or something, and that it, it made was, it come back up. It was between the John Mayer and Maroon 5 albums, okay? <laughs> uh, I was going to say, it must have been a slow time for adult contemporary. But And then the last music we have is three songs by the same band. We have Waiting for You. Beat Away, and Till the End by the Reds. And so what's funny about this is there is very little information when you're tracking down the Reds. Is this another one of those mystery Miami Vice house band issues? (laughs) Oh, no. So the Reds were a punk industrial type band that came out in the late late 70s, around 79, I want to say. And their album, Shake Appeal, which all these songs are featured on, basically got the attention of Michael Mann enough that he had them write numerous songs for Miami Vice, including these three, but not limited to these three, as they we will find in music sections later. Oh, so it is kind of like a Miami Vice house band. Yes. At the request of Michael Mann, they continued to make music just for Miami Vice. And not just that, but for two, he hired them for two of his movies Mm. around the same time. He had them write songs and score for his movies, Band of the Hand, and Manhunter, which is based on the novel Red Dragon. Oh. <laughs> oh. But the Reds have actually made a few different songs for different movies, either together or independently, including the the main song for the Nightmare on Elm Street 2 soundtrack. <laughs> the band's made up of Rick Schaefer and Bruce Cohen. And uh, while I was doing research, I couldn't definitively say it's this guy, but I did read about a Bruce Cohen who is a producer and television guy and suspiciously similar bios, which makes me think that once these guys hooked up with Michael Mann, that's how they got into the movie industry as far as writing scores and stuff. Mm -hmm. And they have branched out beyond that. So uh, be prepared for more talk about the Reds in further episodes. It's amazing how many of those there are like that keep that keep popping up like that. It's everything seems to be coming back to it's a small world. Mm-hmm. And Michael Mann, pretty much everyone he works with, he has they're part of his it's a big reach, his mm-hmm. family. You know, they get reused. And I, I know there's a lot of directors and stuff where they have their guys that they use a lot you look at pt anderson movies Mm -hmm. and stuff and there's a lot of recurring actors that he uses in all of his movies and michael mann was very much this way and maybe he was the pioneer in this being that he just everyone that came through one of his tv shows continued to show up in some form or fashion in other things he did so john there is one other piece of music in this episode and uh our, our our boy jan hammer he dropped Tubbs and Valerie. Oh. An epic score that plays pretty much in scenes involving Valerie. But uh maybe maybe enough to rival Crockett's theme? Maybe. Never. Uh, Never. I'm gonna be Never. 
I'm gonna be completely honest with you because this is mostly instrumental and mostly only used periodically throughout different episodes. I tend to skip over Jan Hammer's musical contributions. <laughs> <laughs> no offense, Jan, but um, I, I can't keep I can't talk about you every week. And I figure I'll, I'll, I want to wait till till because I, I know there's gonna be an episode with some some amazing Jan Hammer music, and I'm trying to wait to talk about him until I get there. So I I, I apologize. If I skip over you every week. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move on and uh, close out this episode because it's it's a mixed bag. So let's go talk about our, our final thoughts. All right, John, this was a long, there was a lot of music in this episode. We have the fantastic Pam Greer and John Turturro in this episode. What are your final thoughts on this, the Rites of Passage episode? I think for an episode that had very little law enforcement actual activity. It was a fantastic episode. You know, I just, I, I love Pam Greer. Um, I love John Turturro. And I think that it, this is probably the best acted episode I've seen so far. And so the thing for me is I just wish that there was a little bit more police procedural involved in it because I felt like we really kind of got off on the tangent here with them kind of doing it just to help out Pam uh, Pam Greer's character. And I felt like we kind of lost the cop aspect in it, at least how it's supposed to be uh, structured. So, But everything else was fantastic. The acting was fantastic. The music was great. Couldn't have asked for more. The only thing I think... The only thing that would have just added a little bit on top, like the cherry on top, was uh, if they would have thrown in a flashback so we knew what what, what happened between Valerie leaving, disappearing in Chicago and ending up in Miami. Because mm-hmm. I'm sure there was some interesting stuff going on there. That fact that she went from being a college student to showing up in Miami as a and becoming a prostitute. I'm sure there's a story there. So yeah, yeah. and that's you know my thoughts too is that at times the story was really lacking. Like it was it it, it we had to make huge assumptions to get to certain parts, especially with all the stuff where they were collecting evidence that was totally inadmissible in court. I was surprised at how much time the vice team spent helping Valerie. But on the flip side, like the episode was well acted. The, the act, not just our guest stars, but the, our normal actors too were really good in this episode. All in all, I was happy with how this episode went. There were some holes in the story, but I'm really happy with, with how, we, what, how we got there. And let's face it, maybe my favorite music segment so far in, in the show so far. So, and that's going out there. Mm-hmm. That, that's going out there. But maybe Whoa there. so yeah, far I mean, might we be have, my favorite. We have Canadian pillow fight therapy to compete with. <laughs> we have... Phil Collins to compete with, okay? I'm sorry, He's Phil. I'm sorry. The king of the Canadian pillow fight. <laughs> so, I mean, it was good. I, I really enjoyed this episode. I was happy that we got away from Dirty Cops and we got a, and we got away from what seems like we've fallen into this trap of either it's a Dirty Cop or the team's going to go out and murder a small village. That pretty much sums it up for me. Jenna, what, what are your final thoughts? I mean, so I more or less echo the sentiments that you both have already shared. But I will say in terms of uh, want, I I really wanted to better understand the reason why Diane and Valerie's relationship was the way it was. I don't care so much about Diane's party lifestyle over the last six months, but like what that triggering event was or like what the a little bit more information about the dynamic of their relationship leading up to that. Like maybe did, was it like parents died and she took over and it was just like a bad thing. Um, just to give me a little bit more context. Plus I was really invested in the characters. Like it was very well acted. And even though the story itself from like a cop drama side was really weak, I wanted to see them tell me more just as it being like a very character driven storyline, which is like, that's me to a T. Like I love very character driven stuff. So, um, and, and I mean, as far as like the procedural side, this is exactly what Miami Vice is. So I don't know <laughs> like that in that regard, I disagree um, because look at past episodes where Crockett or Castillo have had their own personal lives dragging through and the teams just dedicate all of their their energy to it. And in terms of gathering the evidence that's inadmissible, we've seen the guys on more than one occasion trolling around areas where they know are like, 
they're they're local for their contacts or their hotbeds for mischief and they're just looking for something to do or someone to bust and in many cases a lot of that information they can never use in court but they're using it to like pick up little leads here and there so i didn't suck it like i didn't bat an eyelash at that really because it seemed like very very traditional stuff like okay tubs is a backstory this is a tubs backstory episode Mm -hmm. maybe i have to watch tubs have another (laughs) cringeworthy sex scene um but foxy brown makes it totally worth it for me um and yeah i mean i'm totally fine with them having sort of off the off the wheels poorly written storylines if they continue with very character driven stuff like that's what i'm here for and I'm just going to throw this out there to our listeners. If you want to pay me $10,000 a week, I will do dirty, dirty, dirty <laughs> things to you. <laughs> that is, please contact me on Twitter if you're willing to pay me $10,000 a week. How about how about $1,000 a night and they just take that 3000 markup? We'll have to discuss uh, <laughs> details well, further only, on that. Well, only if you get pickle pants. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's going to do it for us this week on that note. Uh, we Thank you for listening and subscribing to the show we hope you're enjoying it we would love 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 your feedback you want to send us some feedback go to the website go with the heat.com click on subscribe and you can see all of the ways that you can subscribe to this show and the ways that you can contact us you can email us go with the heat at gmail.com and we would love to read your emails as well that's going to do it for us this week our last show live all together in the same room so we hope you enjoyed it and we'll see y'all next week bye pals Keep it real.